Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BigPay, Kraken, and Nitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Taming the High Cost of College, Episode 88. You have kids, they grow up, and before you know it, it's time to plan for college. Where do you start? How much is it going to cost? Will you qualify for financial aid? Should you be looking into scholarships? When will you be able to retire? What about student loans? The list of questions is never ending. The good news is, all the answers are right here. Welcome to the Taming the High Cost of College podcast. Here is your host, certified financial planner, Brad Baldridge. Hello, and welcome to Taming the High Cost of College. I'm your host, Brad Baldridge. Today, we have a great interview with Trace Mayer. He is an expert on the Bitcoin. He's very active in the Bitcoin community, and he's going to teach us a ton about Bitcoins and blockchain. And a lot of you are saying, well, what the heck is that? And it's a new technology that's going to potentially revolutionize a lot of secure transactions that we've done in the past how to transfer medical records or stock certificates. It's technology behind the Bitcoin as far as just transferring currency or money from country to country or from person to person without having a third party or a bank in the middle. So it's a lot of great technology. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, what does this have to do with college? Well, a Bitcoin per se is probably a long ways off before you can actually pay for college with a Bitcoin, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there'll be a school soon that will accept a Bitcoin. But more importantly, it's the technology and it's the way you think about the technology and the way your student thinks about technology. Uh, Bitcoin is going to be a potentially a brand new industry, just like cell phones didn't exist when you and I were going to college. Again, we're the old parents in the room, so we didn't have cell phones growing up and we just had a really long cord on our phone and we took it into the bedroom and that's how we got our, our phone from room to room. Since that time, of course, cordless phones have come along and then cell phones have come along and a lot of great advances. There are advances, of course, now in finances and technology as far as around the Bitcoin. So if you're interested in the Bitcoin, by all means, you'll you'll learn a little bit about the Bitcoin, but you also learn bigger applications. We'll learn about block technology and other technologies and just think about, and maybe this isn't the right technology for you. Maybe your student is going to get involved in medical technology or computer science, or engineering technology, or materials, or lighting. I mean, there's all kinds of great technology. Solar. There's huge industries that are being created as we speak. And all these industries are going to need workers, and all these workers are going to need to get trained either on the job or through their own endeavors or through college. And all of this, I think, applies to our future. So go ahead and listen to this great show about Bitcoin. And show notes are available at Taming the High Cost of College slash 88. And Trace does mention a number of websites and so forth. We're going to have that all available for you on the show notes. So you don't need to write them down. You can just come to our website. Uh, but enjoy this interview. And again, think about the bigger picture. How does this apply to our future? Both you, you as parents who maybe you can say, you know what? I don't need technology. I can get by. But what about your students? They're going to have to learn and understand technologies, kind of like you struggle with your cell phone, but they get it. What are they going to be struggling with when they're 40 years old? They're going to, they're going to have to keep up with technology as well. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this great interview with Trace. All right, today we're sitting down with Trace Mayer. He is a Bitcoin expert. He literally wrote the book called Bitcoins for Kids. Uh, welcome, Trace. Oh, glad to be here. All right, so I guess to start with, I think most people listening to this are old and they have kids of their own, and perhaps they've never even heard of what a Bitcoin is, or maybe they've heard of it, but they don't really understand it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what a Bitcoin is, and then we'll jump into a little bit more about what, why you got involved in it and so forth. 
Yeah, so Bitcoin at its kind of fundamental layer, it's a new internet protocol. So, you know, when we go to use the internet, we type in HTTP Amazon.com. And that's actually using a protocol. It's called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Or when we want to send an email to somebody, we use what's called SMTP. It's Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And what protocols are is they're they're rules that these networks, these computer networks and these computers follow in order to move the information around. Now, what's really cool about Bitcoin is it's the first time that we're able to send value over a communications channel. So we're able to, you know, the the easiest way to understand it is we're able to send money over the Internet. And this is at the real root layer of the Internet because everything we've had before, we've always had to go through a centralized third party, whether that's a bank like Wells Fargo or whether it's something like PayPal. But this time we're able to send money directly person to person using Internet protocol. And so... You know, that's just, and that's just one application. We're going to be able to have thousands of applications of this blockchain technology, uh, but it is going to fundamentally kind of change the way that we send money, the way that we establish trust on the Internet. And it's it's really exciting. Right. OK, so I guess there's two things at play here just to kind of clarify. There's the Bitcoin, which is one particular application of this technology. And then there's also the huge market of the underlying technology itself. Is that fair to say? Well, so Bitcoin, in order to use the Internet protocol, you need what are called Bitcoins. They're the token that you use to send around. It's kind of like the gold coin. And then it's also the ability to email it or emailing the gold coin around to everybody, if that helps clarify a little bit. (laughs) Right. But I mean, Bitcoin could go away, but there'd still be this technology behind it, similar to maybe silver replacing gold or gold replacing silver in the ancient days and then paper money replacing that and then et cetera, et cetera. Bitcoin uh, may or may or may not survive, but there's still a huge technological uh, infrastructure behind Bitcoin that might survive and be, you know, come up in a different way. Yeah. I guess to hone in a little bit on that Bitcoin, you've got blockchain technology. And so an analogy would be metal. And then you've got Bitcoin, and an analogy would be gold. And so in order to – and then with gold, we have lots of different uses for gold. We can fill our teeth with it. We can use it in computers or electronics, or we can use it as money. And so uh, that's similar with Bitcoin. You know, we we, it's just one of many different internet protocols that enable us to send value over the internet or these protocols and only you know one use of it is as money but there are lots of other uses that we could use bitcoin for and we could use these other protocols for okay so let's back up a little bit because i we jumped into bitcoin which is obviously very interesting but tell us a little bit more about yourself why why or how did you get involved in this i almost want to call it arcane technology or I mean, it's just, it seems a little out there for a lot of people. And what yeah. you read is is a cross between cool technology and fad, I guess. Yeah, so I've always been interested in money uh, and computers and like all this stuff. And so I ran, or I ran into Bitcoin uh, about seven years ago. That's when Bitcoin started. Uh, and I started, you know, being one of the first evangelists or people that would really talk about it publicly. And that's when it was about five cents per Bitcoin. Uh, currently it trades for about $500. Uh, and, you know, I could see that it had this potential, uh, in so many different ways to just fundamentally add value to society and to humanity. And so that's one of the reasons I got involved in the technology. Uh, and in the process, I've funded a lot of the core Bitcoin infrastructure, uh, like BitPay, for example, where it's the largest merchant processor. Uh, we process for Microsoft and, uh, New Egg and Tiger Direct and a lot of other big companies, and then Kraken, which is the largest exchange. That's where people can trade their bitcoins for dollars or for euros. And then I also funded Armory, which is wallet software where you're able to keep your bitcoins safe, uh, which is obviously a very important thing. You don't want hackers to steal your your bitcoins. <laughs> it's a it's a problem. Right. Absolutely. So. How did this apply again? If I, if I like, if I'm a parent of a 17 year old, and 
what does this all mean to me as far as, you know, what what's down the pipe as far as the future and why we would care about some of this kind of stuff? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the one of the critical issues is one, you just being a responsible parent, you want to kind of know what your kids are doing in terms of technology. Um, they might be a step ahead of you just because it's easier for the younger generation to pick these things up. Uh, but, you know, I think it's important for parents to at least kind of understand a little bit about what their kids are involved in, what their kids are doing. Uh, when I was a teenager, you know, the internet was kind of coming of age and I was very entrepreneurial. And so I actually started some businesses on the internet and made money and paid for my college actually with, with proceeds that I'd made for my businesses. And, one of the biggest problems I had was receiving payment. And, you know, if somebody wants to start up their digital lemonade stand, they can't just go get a merchant account and accept credit cards. I mean, you have to be 18 years old in order to do that. And so any of the, any of the kids that, you know, are entrepreneurial, and I'd highly encourage parents to encourage their children in entrepreneurial in entrepreneurship, because the world economy is just changing so much. Uh, but in order to really be an entrepreneur in the, in this day and age, you almost have to use Bitcoin because you have to be an entrepreneur on the internet. You know, you whether you're you're providing some type of personal service like programming services or something for somebody or selling a product and in order to receive payment you gotta you gotta receive bitcoin uh and you can't receive credit cards because you're shut out because you can't have a merchant account so that's kind of another reason uh why i think it's important for parents to kind of uh you know know what their kids are doing and also encourage them in developing these good habits and these good skills all right absolutely I guess let's talk a little bit about that because I think that's a great analogy. I would say that kids five, 10 years ago, they were the first ones to Facebook and they were doing things, you know, and most of them were good kids, but a few of them were doing things perhaps they shouldn't have been on Facebook long before parents had any idea what Facebook is. And of course, all the kids are now off of Facebook because mom and dad are there and they're off to <laughs> something else. I think it's Snapchat these days. I, I've got a 13 year old and I, you know, I have a hard time keeping up with where he's going, but I think that is an important point you just made that Bitcoin is a way for kids to get the equivalent of cash that parents may not understand what they're doing or how they're doing it. All right. So let's also talk a little bit about the blockchain technology then, because I think that's a little bit revolutionary, you know, not just the technology behind Bitcoin, which is in itself very interesting, but it's technology that may go other places. What, what can you tell us a little bit about what you're what you see coming down the pipe on that? Yeah, so the blockchain technology is the big innovation that uh, is embodied in, in Bitcoin. And what blockchain technology enables is it enables something called distributed consensus or distributed trust. You can think of it like having a ledger, and everybody in the world has a copy of this ledger. And as soon as the ledger gets updated, immediately everybody else's ledger automatically gets updated. And everybody is able to cryptographically prove that the ledger is true and correct all on their own. Uh, so it's mathematically provable. And so this is a huge, huge innovation because it will enable us to, uh, anywhere we need to establish trust, we can use this Bitcoin ledger to do it. Uh, you know, an, an example is when you log into your Wells Fargo bank account and you see these digits on the screen, how do you know that you actually have those many digits in your bank account? And Wells Fargo actually keeps a copy of the ledger, and it's proprietary to Wells Fargo. And that means that Wells Fargo can get out an eraser and just change the balance in your bank account, and they can update it to whatever they want. Well, with the blockchain, you have to be able to to do this in a mathematically provable way, and you can't erase anything that's happened in the past. And so that's a really big innovation and I think is going to bring increased transparency and uh, other forms of trust and stability to our financial system, but also to a lot of other systems, whether it's supply chains or healthcare services or uh, college degrees. You know, you'll be able to prove those mathematically because they can be issued on the blockchain. Just so many different areas. So it's going to it's going to really change the way that we that we establish trust and then authenticate and validate 
whether something has actually happened or not. Okay. So where do you see this technology making its inroads kind of next? All right. Obviously, we've got Bitcoin where we kind of have a, I don't know what the right way to say it, and maybe an alternate economy that is not controlled by anybody, but also where else might we see this coming? That's a great point. It is kind of forming an alternate economy. For example, uh, I have a kid. Uh, there's a there's a kid that does some uh, work for me. He's in Germany, and I pay him with Bitcoin, and he does some programming work, and uh, and he's really good at it. And, uh, and so I pay him in Bitcoin, so he's able to actually save up some money. So because he wants to do a, a foreign exchange into France uh, this coming year, there's also remittances. Sending money to the Philippines or to to other countries like Bitcoin is drastically bringing down the costs of doing things like that. Then further into the future, we're going to see things like robotics and artificial intelligence be getting applied and also being applied with this blockchain technology and, and ownership structure. So, you know, it's really going to remake a lot of our economy and it's going to be really exciting to kind of watch all this happen and in many cases to participate in in making this happen. Some of the some of the really cool innovations that have happened in the Bitcoin space have been done by kids, you know, between the ages of anywhere from about nine to to eighteen. And they've and they've made really significant contributions. And so, you know, that's really cool to see too. And I guess I've read stories now that the technology behind Bitcoin is going to be used perhaps in uh, the stock market and settling stock trades and that kind of stuff. And I think you mentioned earlier when we were talking that it might show up in healthcare as a way to manage records and et cetera. So there's lots of applications for this. Yeah. Like I was just reading an article in Bloomberg yesterday about how State Street, they do about something like 20,000 uh, transactions a day have to have manual intervention uh, stock trades in order for them to be cleared and settled like every single day. Uh, that's going to be completely automated by blockchain technology. So all of those jobs aren't going to be there anymore, at least you know, doing that menial paperwork. There will be jobs writing the software code you know, and writing the systems that interact with Bitcoin and things like that. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of this creative destruction taking place in our economy, kind of like when we discovered electricity, uh, you know, and next thing you know, we've got washing machines for our clothes and that frees up a ton of people's time. Uh, we're going to see the same type of thing happen with this technology. It's going to free up a lot of time. It doesn't mean that, that there aren't going to be any jobs. It's just the jobs are going to be completely different. And I think they're going to be mainly in math, statistics, uh, information systems, robotics, artificial intelligence, things of that nature. Absolutely. And I think another analogy would be the cell phone industry. Um, when you and I were at school and saying we probably were never thought of or were offered the idea of, hey, you could be a programmer and you could design applications for cell phones. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's really crazy to think about. Like when my dad was in college, he used a slide rule. And now I have more processing power in my smartphone than the people who put the man on the moon. You know, I have more processing power than they do. Uh, so, you know, the rate of, at which we're developing our technology and getting it out into the hands of individuals uh, is just happening at a faster and faster rate. Right. And I guess the, the point there is that if you're going to be working in the blockchain technology, you're probably not going to study it in school at this point. Yeah, there there are no classes. You know, uh, I think there's one degree. There's a there's a master's degree in uh, digital currency at a school in Cyprus, uh, but otherwise, I think there's a course at Stanford. There's another course at Princeton that's specifically blockchain technology. There are like three credit courses, uh, three credit hours. But otherwise, I mean, there's not even a scientific journal dedicated to blockchain technology yet. So there's not really a, a synthesized academic discussion going on yet, although there's been a ton of academic work in this area because it's the hottest thing in cryptography and uh, and actually a lot of the legal journals really like things that are called smart contracts that can be enabled with blockchain technology. So you know, a lot of the academic firepower is starting to kind of turn its attention to it, but we don't really have the classes in school 
yet for it, which means that you know when somebody like Goldman Sachs or uh, one of these banks wants to hire somebody with blockchain experience, there's just not really anybody with that experience to hire, uh, which means that if your kid has been tinkering around on Bitcoin for a couple years, guess what? They're going to have a leg up for a lot of these jobs. And these jobs are also paying a significant amount of money. I mean, we're most of them are easily six figures, you know, $100,000 or so a year or more for uh, even entry entry slash one to two year experience blockchain engineers. So, you know, and I think it, I think the demand is only going to continue to increase for it also. Right. And I, and again, this is the technology that you're familiar with and we're talking about here, but there's probably similar applications in many different areas and many different technologies where in general, there's a whole lot of jobs out there that we don't know what they're going to be yet, but five years or 10 years from now, again, like the cell phone industry, the whole programming a cell phone didn't exist 20 years ago, and now it's a huge industry. And I think this is a, an area that may become a huge industry as well. Right. And being, being a computer programmer, having you know computer science degree or math or statistics or physics, you know any of these degrees where you, you've had to learn how to use computation, uh, I think is a very valuable skill. And you know, in that toolkit of computation, you have to have blockchain experience now. It's just absolutely vital um, if you're going to be a good programmer. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So you also were involved in your the book, uh, Bitcoin for Kids. So can you tell us a little bit about that book? Could that be applicable for parents of in what age groups? And Yeah. So I, I actually edited the book. It oh, was written okay. by the... Uh, the Sabra sisters, uh, they're, they're, uh, and I think they were 11 or 12 at the time that they wrote it. Uh, it's a very interesting book because it, it basically uh, goes over how kids can use, how kids, how and why kids would use Bitcoin. And then it also provides some case studies. And I actually found these case studies to just be absolutely fascinating. There was one kid that uh, goes by the name Plasmotech, that's his handle. Uh, but he would code Python for people. And this is an 11-year-old in the Netherlands. And he would get paid via Bitcoin. And he amassed over like 1,100 Bitcoins from getting paid in it, which at current value today is about $600,000. <laughs> so, you know, you've got these kids that are running their little entrepreneurial businesses. And then the Bitcoin price also kind of tends to trend in an upward direction. So they really get a multiple in terms of uh, their, the efficacy of their savings. Another example were uh, there were a set of three brothers in, I think, northern Utah, and they had this bee business. So they would farm the bees for honey, and they're called the Bees Bros. Uh, that's their website, B-E-E-S-B-R-O-S.com. And you can buy like honey, ba- honey lip balm and and uh, and honey roasted almonds and stuff like that. And from what I understand, they've, uh, you know, they're multimillionaires now because of how much, uh, how much product they've sold and they've kept it all in Bitcoin and stuff like that. And so it's really, really cool to see these kids uh, running, internet, running internet businesses, making money, learning all of those skills of business and operations and solving customer needs, but then also getting the benefit of this foreign currency exchange uh, aspect because, you know, they've got to manage their expenses in dollars, but they're getting revenue in Bitcoin and, and all of these different things. I, I think it's just life lessons that these kids are learning at such a young age that are just really going to serve them well in the future, especially as we, we become a more international and a more interconnected global world. Right, absolutely. So let's say I have a, and I actually I, have, I do have a kid that's very interested in technology and gaming, and you know he built his own computer system for you know that was his Christmas present last year, and he's starting to you know spend a lot of time on his computer. What would be a good way to introduce a young person to Bitcoin? As far as is there a book that would this be appropriate book, or is there other books, or um, how would we get you know where do you get started? Yeah, so uh, there's several websites out there. One of them that's really easy is weusecoins.com. It's targeted for brand new users of Bitcoin. Uh, there's 
uh, also another one called Bitcoin.org, and that has more developer reference and implementation type stuff. So if they've already got some programming skills and stuff like that, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the type of thing you, you you just go and start tinkering around. You know, try to figure out how to buy your first five dollars worth of Bitcoin, and then start sending it around and you have to get comfortable with the technology and you just learn by doing it. Uh, you know, we can talk about theoretically like riding a bike, but just trying to get on the bike for five minutes, you know, is worth hours and hours of theoretically talking about it. All right. So that brings up another question. I had noticed that Bitcoin is today worth somewhere in the neighborhood of four or $500 per coin. Is that still true? Yeah, it's worth. Uh, I think it's currently at like five hundred eighty dollars. Oh, okay. uh, it it can get real volatile sometimes. Like uh, it's been very stable over the last year, and then for whatever reason, in the last week or two, it's just gone crazy. It's gone from like four hundred and fifty dollars to five hundred eighty dollars. So you know, it's real stable, and then uh, then it just got real volatile. <laughs> right. Okay. So does that mean I need to put it? Put five hundred and eighty dollars in and buy a coin, or how does that work? Oh, it's uh, it's divisible to the eighth decimal, actually. So uh, you you know you can buy any fraction. You can buy one dollars worth. You could buy a thousand dollars worth. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's infinite. You know, it's pretty much infinitely divisible in that sense. So yeah, you don't have to buy a whole bitcoin, uh, and you can you know you can buy maybe. Fifty dollars worth, and then there's there's actually a website called Purse.io, and what you're able to do there is you're able to import an Amazon wish list, and then you set the discount that you want to receive, and the average discount people get is about twenty percent. So you can buy Bitcoin, immediately send it to Purse, import your wish list, the person who wants to buy Bitcoin, they buy your wish list, it gets sent to you, and after you receive the items, then you release the Bitcoin from escrow. And so that's an immediate way that you, that, that you can actually save a lot of money learning how to use this technology. Okay. Why, I guess, why would people do that on the other end? It seems like they're losing money. Yeah. You know, this highlights the, the inefficiencies of our current payment systems because Amazon has, they have something called mechanical Turk and that's a way for people to do kind of micro transactions. They do data entry or, you know, other little menial jobs and they get paid like a dollar here and a dollar 50 there. Well, a lot of these people are in the Philippines or they're in Bangladesh. They're somewhere where Amazon doesn't ship product and they don't have good, reliable financial infrastructure. So they get paid. They don't have bank accounts. So they get paid with Amazon gift card credit. Then they, Amazon doesn't ship to them. So they're stuck with this Amazon gift card credit that they got paid, you know, they got paid with, but no way to really realize the value in their life. And so they actually find it more advantageous to turn around and buy something on Amazon for somebody and then get Bitcoin because they can turn the Bitcoin into their Philippine pesos or or whatever their local currency is a lot easier. Uh, so, you know, it's helping, Bitcoin's helping make the, the global economy just remove a lot of the frictions that come about because of uh, our current payment infrastructure because it's just so hard to get payments sent all over the world, you know, and Amazon and Google and a lot of these companies uh, face challenges with that. Okay. So do you foresee or do you think like and companies like Amazon and Google will start accepting Bitcoin soon? Uh, yeah, some of them do already. Uh, like Microsoft accepts Bitcoin and they use BitPay, which is the merchant processor that I invested in. Uh, and then Overstock.com, they accept Bitcoin and they actually ship now to all all countries in the world pretty much. And so Amazon only accepts payment and only ships to about 50, 55 countries. And so they're leaving entire country. They're not even competing in entire countries. And the main reason they're not competing is because they can't, you know, those countries don't really have credit cards and it's not feasible to take uh, bank account wire transfers because it costs like 50 bucks or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, Amazon's either going to start accepting something like Bitcoin or they're just going to leave the entire market to some, to a competitor like Overstock. 
And also, uh, accepting Bitcoin, there's no PCI compliance costs, there's no fraud, there's no chargebacks. So it's actually a lot cheaper to accept Bitcoin also for the companies. So there's really not a lot of downside for them, and there's a lot of upside. Okay. Now, what about the IRS? What does the IRS think of Bitcoin? Yeah, so the IRS has actually issued guidance, uh, and they they recommend that it be treated like property, which means that uh, there there needs to be capital gain or capital loss uh, associated with it. Um, so you know, if you're and, and I think that that's mainly, I mean, it's I suppose applicable to everybody, but it's you know, it's mainly for the larger like Fortress Investment Group bought twenty million dollars worth of Bitcoin. And so they wanted to know, since they're publicly traded, they wanted to know how to account for it on their on their uh, financial statements and also how to treat it for tax purposes. And so the IRS put out this type of guidance. And a lot of the different wallet software and stuff, it will help uh, people who do want to be compliant with all the taxes to every last penny. Uh, it'll help uh, calculate those gains and losses, uh, you know, appropriately. Okay. So... Technically, then, even if my son, Zach, was trading in Bitcoin and he made, he had, I guess he had earnings because he had a job and they paid him in Bitcoin, and then the Bitcoin went up in value, he would have both wages to put on taxes and capital gains? Yes, assuming that uh, there was a recognition event with the capital gains. Right, if he sold it again. Okay. Right, or traded it for something or, you know, bought something with it. Okay. Um, yeah, technically, you know, he should be filling out tons of forms and voluntarily de- declaring all of this income and, you know, otherwise being a, a good model citizen, right? Uh, which I think it's, you know, these are great lessons to teach kids who are, you know, trying to run their little digital lemonade stand and make a couple bucks. Right. And it's all, I guess, if you're making a few hundred dollars, it's probably moot. But as soon as you get into the taxable realm, I guess you need to keep track of it. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I'd recommend everybody do. You know, we don't want to have, uh, I don't like having to look over my shoulder or anything. So, uh, you know, I I make sure that I try to have a good faith effort of being compliant with everything. Uh, but of course, there are people that, for whatever reason, don't want to do that. And, you know, that's their prerogative, I suppose. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we uh, learned a lot about Bitcoin and this up and coming technology. I really appreciate your time. If people want to learn more, where can they uh, get a hold of you? Or I know you have a podcast and other things. So tell us about that. Yeah. So I I also host a podcast. It's called the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. On it, I interview the CEOs of different Bitcoin companies. So you know, if you want to learn about what different people are doing with their companies in the Bitcoin space. It's a, it's a really good resource for that. And uh, then for, you know, just learning in general about Bitcoin, I recommend we use coins.com and also Bitcoin.org. All right. Well, great. I will put all this information that we just talked about into the show notes, as well as uh, your podcast, et cetera. I appreciate all the great information. Yeah, Glad to be here. And, you know, I really hope that your audience are able to prepare the next generation for this huge uh, opportunity and change that we have coming in the future. All right. Well, thank you again. All right. That was a great interview with Trace. I'd like to uh, just spend a minute here and talk to you a little bit about some of the past episodes that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. We, number 72, we had an interview with Michael Vauder. He's with the Robot Academy. That's a great episode for students that are looking to use technology. In this case, it was robotics. But again, if you're in in any sort of tech area, how he used robotics to win a bunch of scholarships and kind of get involved in the robotic community as early as high school. So that was a great interview. And then number 25, we have an interview with Niall Nickel. And he talks about using LinkedIn and how LinkedIn could be used certainly as soon as possible. I was just talking with a school counselor who now is recommending for some students, especially that they start as as soon as age 13, when they're allowed to create their LinkedIn account, they go ahead and get started and start building an online resume that they can use through high school and then use through college and then ultimately use it when college is finished as part of their recruiting and finding their first job. But for many students, you're networking and building your links and 
getting plugged into the whatever industry or world you want to get involved in can start as soon as you're 13 and you're allowed to have that LinkedIn account. So if you want to learn more about LinkedIn, that's number 25 as well. So there's a couple other episodes. And of course, there's many back episodes about all sorts of topics. So if you're new to podcasting, you can go to uh, iTunes, Apple iTunes, and there's a whole list of podcasts there under Taming the High Cost of College. Or you can go directly to our website at Taming the High Cost of College. Click on the podcast tab, and then there will be a list of all the back episodes and all the show notes for all 88 episodes that we've put out there so far. Again, I hopefully this has been great information for you. We appreciate you listening. And if you have any comments or questions, feel free to give us feedback. You can send us an email. You can give us a call, whatever you'd like to do. We appreciate you listening, and we'll be back again next week. Thank you for listening to the Taming the High Cost of College podcast. Now it's time for you to take action. Head to TamingTheHighCostOfCollege.com for show notes, bonus content, and to leave feedback for Brad. The next step on your college journey starts now. Brad Baldridge is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research and an investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through Cambridge Investment Research Incorporated, a broker-dealer and member of FINRA and SIPC. Brad owns two companies, Baldridge Wealth Management and Baldridge College Solutions. The Baldridge companies are not affiliated with Cambridge Investment Research. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin Guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at Bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.